her test on the results on the end of the barrel of the gun, I just anticipate her saying more than it was a mixed result and I drew no conclusions. I'm anticipating that she will say that the mixed conclusion, that the mixed result, it will be at least inferred or implied that that DNA belonged to Daniel Rodriguez. And it seems to me that she can't do that within a reasonable scientific possibility. But I think somehow that's where the prosecution is going to go with this line of questioning. And it's so fraught with danger that its relevance, its prejudicial value far outweighs its relevance. A mixed result of what? And that's what the jury is going to want to know and that is what the prosecution in one form or another is going to either imply or specifically get out. And it's scientifically worthless information and therefore not relevant. And they have no way to tie all this in scientifically. It's just guesswork. So you're asking me to do what? To preclude her from answering that question. She can say she tested it and that the results were inconclusive because that's that. But it seems to me that to lead her in a series of questions that Mr. Martinez likes to do with witnesses to imply that it's inconclusive because she had Mr. Rodriguez's DNA and she did this and she did that and we've got these peaks and these alleles with no, I mean I can go in much more scientific detail as to why she can't do it. But I think he's going to attempt to imply it. And it gives the jury no information. He wants the jury to know it was tested and there are no conclusions. If that's all it was, I'd have no problem with that because that's what the lady said. Under oath, I cannot testify to any conclusion. If that's the testimony he wants, of course that's fine because that's the truth. But that's not what he wants, Judge. So your objection is to the partial mix aspect? Yes, sir. And the other questions that would lead up to that because there will be. I'm not, I know that you're not privy to the e-data. I'm not privy to any of the data. Mr. Martinez, do you know what the basis for Ms. Stoller's opinion that there was a partial mix? Yes, she conducted a test of it. Well, the F, the e-grams, the electrocardiogram chart looking things. You'll have to ask her. She will testify that there was DNA there, biological material, which the neural 701, 702, and 703, she can say that looking at that, she made a determination that it was a partial mix of biological material, DNA, and she can draw no conclusions. And under 701, 702, and 703, she can do that. And why do you, the other aspect of it, why do you believe that's relevant? It's relevant because one of the things that happened in this case is that Sergio Verhill has testified that at the time that he and Officer Christman entered into the trailer, that Christman placed the gun on Mr. Rodriguez's left temple. That is, in the charge that resulted from that, is aggravated assault. If it had nothing to do with the charge, then I can see why there would be a claim that it was irrelevant. But it goes to the charge, and this proves, or doesn't prove, but it does indicate that there was some biological material there. They just can't, she just can't say or give an opinion as to whose it was, and she's not going to. I mean, this is something that she was asked about. That's something that she's always said. A report has always indicated that. Nothing has changed. So I believe that I should be allowed to ask it under 701, 702, and 703. Will there be any testimony about how many contributors? She will say that it was a partial mix. That's all she can say, and I'll ask her right now. Any idea? Are you going to say how many contributors? She'll say at least two, but she doesn't know. Mr. Marans, it's your motion. You get the last word. That's the implication that it's going to leave, because 
we have three samples, the Jellos, uh, Rodriguez's, and Christmas. And the implication is obvious. Yeah. But under the rules of science, they don't allow that type of testimony because it doesn't reach the level uh, of certainty that it should be admissible. He's trying to take A and get to B by going around through C because he puts in whose DNA did you have? Well, we had these three. And what did you have on the end of the gun? Had a partial mix. Do you have any conclusions? No, it was DNA, somebody's. And it, it leaves the jury with an impression. Um, if you look at the charts, there were at least two because in some of the, uh, and I mean on, on her charts, the chart that um, we're, we're talking about, just this muzzle of the gun, um, the, the peaks um, show two, three, and even four. She doesn't know, um, she can't say. I mean, she's trying to do the right thing as a scientist, say, I reach no conclusion. He is trying to leave the jury with the impression that, yes, there is a conclusion. And the conclusion is it was probably Danny Rodriguez's because of how it went. On that, Mr. Martinez, from Ms. Stoller's belief, because of the levels that are required, she can't make any conclusion. You're asking the jurors to use that to support Officer Regillo's version of events. Absolutely, because she can say that there was but there's a partial DNA mix. Isn't that where 403 kicks in? There's no basis for that. I, there is a basis for it. She can say there was some DNA there. She just can't say whose DNA it was. Um, but isn't that the whole point of it then? That may be the whole point of it, but if I have the evidence, I may be able to use it. It's like saying, well, you have a bullet and it matches to the gun. You can't use it because uh, it matches to the gun. Uh, what I'm saying here is that they can ask her as many times as they want whether or not there was a conclusion, and she'll say no. Uh, the fact that, that it may buttress Virgilio's um, version of events, does, that's the reason why I want it. If we remember, uh, Officer Virgil has been called a liar. He's been indicated that he was in the bushes. All of these things, on and on. And um, this. But then, why? What does Miss Stoller give you that makes it more likely than not likely that Mr. Rodriguez's DNA is is part of that combination on Mr. Chrisman's gun? Because there's DNA there. It indicates that. There's DNA there, and for example, in the inside of the barrel of the handgun, she's going to indicate there's no results, indicating there's no DNA there. That's the difference. He's not, that's, that's the other thing that she's going to testify to. And she's also going to testify that uh, uh, heat has a tendency to destroy or degrade DNA. In this case, what we have is the inside of the barrel, no results, because there's no DNA there. The difference is that on the end or the end of the muzzle, which is outside, and is not subject to all that, there was some DNA that was captured. Um, any, the, 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 the law is clear that a expert can testify, a DNA expert can testify whether or not there was some DNA there. They can make their arguments, I can make my arguments, they can point fingers and say, she never said it was Daniel Rodriguez. That's true, she's never going to say it was Daniel Rodriguez's. She'll never say it was Richard Christmans, and she'll never say it was Sergio, Sergio Virgil's. She'll just say it's DNA. That's all she can say. Well, that's different than what partial mix is a different statement than there's DNA there. Well, the only way that you get a partial mix is, and quite frankly, when it indicates that it's a partial mix, it actually works against the state because now you're talking about two contributors. We don't know who they could possibly be. If it were just one contributor, of course, that would make my argument stronger. The fact that she says it's a partial mix just sort of speaks to another individual being there. We don't know who it could be. It could be Chrisman. It could be, we, we just don't know. But there is DNA there, and she can say there is DNA there. Scientific, scientifically speaking, she can say that. There is a charge of aggravated assault, and the aggravated assault. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Marin, just on the issue of uh, the state's ability to present to the jury that they've done a full investigation, just the fact that they, they've had testimony about swabbing of the gun 
DNA being found there, but in no amount to make any conclusion. I understand that point, Your Honor, and it is legitimate, and they certainly should be, so that they don't want me to argue, gee, they should have tested it and things like that. I understand that. That would be just as unfair if I were to take that approach as the approach they're taking, because they're going to say that the samples she had and the tests she ran were those of Virgilio Fernandez and Crisma, and that's where they're going with that. Again, I have no problem with there was a test and it was inconclusive, but it will lead up to it, and it will imply that it had to be Virgilio, Crisma, or Rodriguez, and we know Virgilio didn't run his gun, and since it was a partial mix, there go, that means there was two of them, and that means him and Rodriguez. That's the argument they will make, and that is so scientifically bogus, because there just wasn't enough there to run a real test where we could conclusively say there was something there or there something wasn't there. They're trying to use an analogy that is scientifically improper, and jurors are going to be very sensitive, and I think the prejudicial value of this far outweighs any probative value. You have said, and I agree with you, it is probative that they let the jury know that they tried to find out. They just couldn't, and the way he wants, the way the prosecution wants to go about doing that is to imply that it was Mr. Rodriguez's, when scientifically we absolutely don't know that, but the way the questioning will lead, it will come out that way. If you let that come in, it just has no relevance in this case, Judge. I just want to make sure I understand, you have no objection to Mr. Martinez eliciting from Ms. Stoner that biological material was seen, but no test, no conclusion could be derived from looking at the barrel of the gun. If those are the only two questions, I would think that would be legitimate to show that the state tried to do their job. You object to the partial mix conclusion. Partial mix and the other questions about whose DNA did you have, and what did you put in this electro, whatever that thing is. Mr. Martinez, with the new, the Dauber thing, doesn't Dauber tell us that we shouldn't allow in the courtroom information beyond the science? That's correct, it's not beyond the science. This is within the science. If you take a look at the, and I may have it marked to show you, there are peaks and valleys there, which indicate that there is this partial mix. Anybody can read it that has that training and can say that there are these peaks and valleys and it is a partial mix. This issue under Dauber has been decided a long time ago, so no, I don't see it as a Dauber issue. This is something that has been well settled. What you do is you run the DNA test. If you get these peaks and valleys, you read them, and then you draw your conclusions from that. That's all that she's doing. In fact, I'll have her mark it so that you can see that there were these peaks and valleys and that she received some numbers from it. From those numbers, which are called profiles, and no one has ever indicated that these profiles are something that is new under Dauber, from these profiles, the individuals can see that there was a partial mix. Well, that's what I'm trying to get. You guys have me at a disadvantage. I haven't seen these charts. How many of them were reportable? How many peaks were reportable? Let me go have them marked. There certainly were peaks, but the problem is this isn't within the science. That's the problem. It's without the science because it doesn't raise itself. These peaks, to use an analogy, don't raise themselves. That's why I asked the question. I don't know the answer to the question. That's why I asked the question. You guys have interviewed Ms. Stoller. I have not. I'll have it marked. 
If the parties don't object, if I can ask Ms. Stoller a couple of questions. I do not object. Ms. Stoller, you just happen to be here. I might as well pick your brain. With respect to the testing that you've done of the face of the barrel of Mr. Christman's gun, what conclusions were you able to draw? And what was the basis for believing that there was a partial mix? able to discern that these were alleles rather than shadows. Yes. And what do you mean when you say you, that you could draw no conclusions? Okay. You've answered all of my questions. Mr. Martinez, any questions of Ms. Stoller on this issue? No, I just I need to. Mr. Merritt. No, Your Honor. All right. If you want. No, I, I just, so I can say. With regard to this particular issue, what, we, what you have are the, it would be Exhibit 353 at the top, and then in the bottom, and then on 354, the top portion. Uh, as the court can see, what we have here is the peaks and the valley that are traditionally associated with this type of analysis, and they all have numbers associated with these particular um, um, tests. And that's the same top, the bottom, and then also again on the second page. Um, because of those peaks and valleys, she is able to give numerical values. For example, if you take a look at this first peak, I believe that's a 10 and a 14. The next one is a 31.2, the next one's a 12, 11, 15, 7, 9, 11, and 19. Mr. Martinez, time out. Uh, because you want to elicit that information, I take it there'll be some exhibit reflecting a, bi uh, a full DNA profile of Mr. Crisman and a full DNA profile of uh, Mr. Rodriguez. There will be, but I will not be eliciting the readings that I'm showing you here. I'm showing these to you because this is this has been this is accepted science. What they keep saying is that it's junk science. It isn't. It no, isn't. I haven't heard that. But what I want to know is whether uh, Mr. Rodriguez has at any of those alleles a 10, a 14, a 31.2, a 12, 11, a 15, a 7, a 9, 11, or a 19. Yes, and I can uh, uh, read his profile. And the court under 402 and 403 would preclude any reference by Ms. Stoller about the face of the gun, except that there was biological material found, but no conclusions could be drawn. Again, are we ready? Are we otherwise ready? Yes, yeah, sure.
Just before we do that, time out. We had a change of mind. Hold on a second. Mr. Martinez. Um, one of the things that, uh, for example, that uh, she did is she did the utility belt. And, for example, inside the gun holster, she indicates that, that she can draw no conclusions with regard to the minor, even though there's DNA there. Um, with regard to the... Other belt area, for example, you can you indicate the utility belt right of the gun of the holster. It indicates that there's a mixture of at least two contributors, noting that that's something that she's going to be able to testify to in this case. Well, I'm only working off the objections I got. I haven't heard any motion in limine, so if there's objections, I'll deal with them. There hadn't been a motion in limine on anything but the face of the gun, so I have my antenna out. I'll just listen. He was just talking about, as I understand it, the um, end of the muzzle. That's what we're talking about. That's what I took the motion to be limited to. The slide in the frame of the gun is the same result. It's a mixture of at least two contributors, but can't draw any conclusions. I've only heard a motion in limine with okay. respect to the okay. face of the gun. Why wouldn't... What is the relevance of any of no conclusions other than to confuse the jury? Okay. I'm hearing all these motions now. From, I don't know what your motion is, Mr. Merritt. I would make the same motion on the same grounds for all of these tests where there are no conclusions. You reached. When she says that it could be anybody's, what, what possible probity value does that have to this case as to what was on his gun belt? Well, again, I think it's different than what you objected to before. I, th I think you have conceded that the state's entitled to uh, show to the jurors that swabs were taken, yes. stopped, swabs were analyzed, but no results could be drawn. I have, Your Honor. So I don't know what tests were taken. I don't know what analysis was done. So I don't know what conclusions are drawn. All I know is what you made a motion for. So what are you asking me to do now? I, as long as it was just there were tests and there were no conclusions that this that this expert can reach, that's fine. I, I think that, that is probative from, from their standpoint. So that I'm not allowed to argue, gee, they didn't do anything with this stuff. But it, I just didn't know if that's all. Let's ask and answer. Well, I don't know what the questions are going to be. I don't know what the answer is going to be. I, I just responding to what counsel just indicated they were headed, and it led me to believe they're headed somewhere else. Mr. Martinez, I took. If I take your comment as a motion, let me. Are you asking me to do anything now? No, I'm not. We can just proceed. I already. I, I think I know what your ruling is with regard to the previous muzzle of the gun. All right. We'll try again. Please be seated. Record to reflect the presence of Mr. Crispin, counsel, and the jurors. Mr. Martinez, you may call your next witness. Kathleen Stoller.
tell me where the testimony you're about to give is true. I'm not sure if Kathleen Stoller. Who did you work for back in October, November, and December of 2005? I worked for the Phoenix Police Department in the crime laboratory. What did you do for them? I was a forensic scientist, and I did DNA analysis. The DNA analysis, what is it that it analyzes? What is it that you're trying to look for? I'm trying to look for the DNA type at several different locations so that I can use it to compare known samples from people to question samples from a crime scene or some other evidence. These samples, does it make a difference, for example, if you have saliva versus blood, and then you try to compare it to another sample of a cell? Does it make a difference what the biological material is? No, it does not. As far as the DNA type goes, it's easier to get DNA profiles from saliva and blood than it is from some other types of evidence, but the DNA profile will not change. You're talking about a DNA profile. What is a DNA profile? A DNA profile gives us the DNA type at each of the specific locations that we're looking at. We get half of our DNA from our mother and half of it from our father, so we're going to have a mixture of those two people at each of those locations. When you say that you have a profile, explain it a little bit more for me. Are we talking about numbers, or how is it that, what are we talking about? The DNA types are designated by numbers, yes. And you said that you get one from your mother and from your father. Yes. Does that mean that you have two numbers at each location? You can have two numbers at each location if you get a different DNA type from each parent. If you get the same DNA type from each parent, for instance, if you got an 11 DNA type from your mother and an 11 from your father, then you would only have one type at that location. The profiles that you get, how many areas or locations do you look at? Do you want to look at a profile? Yes. Let me go ahead and have you show you a couple. Let's take a look at exhibits 355, 356, and 357. Do you recognize these? Yes, I do. And are those profiles? Yes, they are. The fullest number, I think, is 356. 355. With regard to 355, is this a profile that you developed? Yes, it is. Who is that a profile of? This is a profile of Richard Crisman. How about 356? Is that a profile that you developed? Yes, it is. Who is that a profile of? Daniel Rodriguez. And 357, is that also a profile? Yes, it is. And that profile is from whom? Sergio Brugillo. If I may have those, please. I have no object. I have no problem with your using them in the testimony, but I don't know that they are helpful to the jury in deciding that I don't think they have any probative value as an exhibit. But she can certainly use them as she testifies. You have no objection as a demonstrative exhibit, but you have an objection to them as an admitted exhibit. I have no objection to her using them and giving her testimony today. She prepared them. 
I don't think they have any probative value as in this case as yet. Maybe they might, but I don't see any yet. Do you want to use them as demonstrative exhibit or as an admitted exhibit? Admitted exhibit. The objection as stated is overruled 55, 56, and 57 are admitted and may be published for any purpose. Let's take a look at that exhibit 355. And looking at it, how many locations are there that we're talking about? We're talking about 15 different locations on the DNA for DNA types and one called amylogenin, which is a sex determining site. And if you take a look at 355, that's this one right here, correct? That's correct, yes. XY means what? Male. And XX means? Female. So basically what you would actually have, if you take a look at it, is you have two numbers for each of these columns, right? Or can you also have one number? You can also have one. There will be one or two numbers in each of those locations. But I thought you told me that we get one of the numbers or one of those locations from both our mother and father. Why is it that, for example, at D7S820, you have only the number 9 on exhibit 355? That means that Mr. Chrisman got a 9 from his mother and a 9 from his father. And the same thing can be said for the 11 that's down here as well as the 8 and then the 18, right? That's correct, yes. These locations that you are looking at, are they designated? Are they important for any reason? In other words, why look at those locations as opposed to other locations? These are locations where differences have been seen between people. These are the locations that are in the DNA typing kit that we were using at that time. Thirteen of these locations were chosen by the FBI to be put into the national database, so everybody was using those 13, plus there are two extras in this kit. Most, well, everybody has two arms, two legs, and that sort of thing. How much of the individual's DNA is similar between people? Between people, over 99.9% of our DNA is identical. So how is it, if it's 99.9% identical, why is it that we can have exhibit 355 with what we call the profile? This is looking at locations on the DNA where there are differences between people. Other than identical twins, no two people have exactly the same DNA. And these locations are the ones that differentiate people, is that what you're saying? These are some of the ones that will, yes. Exhibit 356, for example, we can take a look at that. That's the profile of Daniel Rodriguez, and then it has his profile on there, right? Correct. And 357 is the profile of Sergio Verdillo, correct? Correct. These locations, have you ever heard the term loci? Do you know what that means? Yes. What is loci? Each of the locations is called a locus, and the plural of locus is loci. DNA, again, you told us that it could be from the fingers, it could be from the blood, it could be from the saliva. If it's from the fingers, are you familiar with the term touch DNA? Yes, I am. What is touch DNA? Touch DNA would be DNA that was developed from skin cells, from somebody touching an item. How many cells, do you know, how many cells have to be left behind in order for it to give a result? In a perfect situation, we are looking for approximately one nanogram, which is one billionth of a gram of DNA to put into the reaction for this type of testing. For one nanogram of DNA, we need about 150 cells. We can get results lower than that, between 40 and 50 cells will generally give us a full profile, but that assumes that the cells are in perfect condition and that everything is perfect all the way along the line. With DNA, does it have, again, and we're really talking about biological material, but this biological material, this DNA, is it something like a guided missile, if you will, 
that if you're standing, standing 20 to 25 feet away, does, it, does the DNA sort of, sort of go out, turn corners, and then stick on something? Is, is that how that works? Or is it something else? Is, is there a different sort of um, mechanism at work here with regard to DNA and when it's left behind? DNA is not going to fly out and turn corners to land on something. DNA can land on something, for instance, if I'm talking over this paper and some spit hat comes out, I can get my DNA on this paper. If I'm touching something, I can get my DNA on it. Now, just because I touch something or just because I'm talking here doesn't mean that I'll have enough DNA to test. So, for example, if we take a look at exhibit number 26, Photograph. And we've already been told this is a taser. Would it be something that, for example, that if this taser was always on the outside, would it be the situation that if an individual was on the inside 20, 25 feet away, would it be possible for the DNA to somehow be like this? Again, I can't think of anything other than a guided missile that came out and turned around and hit that taser. Is that something that could happen? No. Well, let's take a look at uh, what's been called the Virgil Taser. This is exhibit 222, but yours is, uh, I believe, uh, are you familiar with invoice number 39546140002? Yes, I am. And that references a particular taser, right? Yes, it does. And what's the serial number of that particular taser? That is um, X00-167980. And that's the Virginia taser that we've been talking about. Did you have occasion to conduct a test on any of the um, swabs that were taken from that taser? Yes, I did. And... With regard to that taser, did you get a result? Yes, I did. And what result did you get with regard to that taser? I obtained a mixed DNA profile from at least two people. A major part of that matched Mr. Rodriguez. Let's take a look at uh, another exhibit. This would be exhibit number 358. Yes, it is. And that's the true and accurate, I guess, reading at every one of those loci with regard to that particular slide in the Brazil taser. Yes, it is. Remember for the admission of the exhibit 358? No objection. 358 admitted, may be published. Ma'am, let's just, uh, hy hy hypothetically speaking, since you're an expert, if Mr. Rodriguez is inside exhibit 94 and he never makes it outside, is it possible that somehow from this position there's a straight out DNA that goes out and takes a right and goes all the way out? Is it possible for that to happen? Not by itself, no. When you say not by itself, what are you saying? It would have to be transported some way. Well, could the other way that it could be done, could it also be that the taser came in contact with him at some point? That's possible, yes. 
But the person who then took the taser, and if it was the person who carried it, they would have had to have come in contact with Mr. Rodriguez too, right? If they're the ones that transferred, they are the ones that are transferring the taser, right? If the taser came in contact with Mr. Rodriguez, I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? In this case, you have this profile that we've talked about that was just admitted, which is exhibit number 358. And you told us that the major profile of this was Daniel Rodriguez, correct? Correct. When you say major profile, what are you talking about? When I say a mixed DNA profile, I mean that there was DNA present from more than one person. When I can say that there is a major component to that mixed DNA profile, that means that one person left more DNA on that particular item than any other contributors. And on this particular taser, who left the most DNA? The major component matches Mr. Rodriguez. And if we look at 358 and 356, this is what you're talking about, right? Yes. Why are some of these numbers, for example, in these brackets? What does that mean? A number in a bracket means that it's a very small peak or a very small DNA type, and it's less than our interpretation threshold. And so how is it that, what is the way that DNA gets on a substance, for example, for example, on a taser, such as exhibit 222? How is it that DNA gets on a substance or an item like a taser? How is it that it's transferred there? DNA can be transferred from saliva, from blood, from touch. But aren't we talking in terms of geographic location, does there have to be ever a connection between the two of them in terms of geographic location? Can one be 20 feet away around the corner for that to transfer? I can think of hypotheticals, but there has to be something that either the taser comes in contact with the person or somebody who's moving the taser has had contact with the person and then touches the taser, for instance, if it was blood. But the DNA is not going to jump down the hall and around the corner by itself. Does it talk to, in terms of the DNA profile, such as this one, is it talking about situations where DNA travels by itself, again, 20, 30 feet, without there being any connection between the two? No, DNA will not travel by itself. You say that the major component is Daniel Rodriguez. Do you have an opinion as to who the minor component is? The major component matches Daniel Rodriguez, and I can draw no conclusions from the minor component. There's not enough information there. What does that mean, that you can draw no conclusions? It means that looking at that profile, looking at the places where there are DNA types, either in parentheses or in brackets, that's not enough information for me to be able to compare it to any other people. So I can't draw any conclusions as to the source of that minor component. Just for illustrative purposes, you said you couldn't draw any conclusions, but if we go to Exhibit 357, Sergio Virgilio, it doesn't mean that there aren't any that match. For example, if you have a 10 and a 12 here, it means that scientifically speaking, you can't draw any conclusions, even though you may have, for example, a match here and a match there, right? No, that 10 is too small for me to be able to say that that 10 came from one person. There could be other peaks that should go with that 10 that I'm not seeing. So scientifically, the minor component has to be called inconclusive. Is that something that is new to the science, is calling something inconclusive, or is that something that has been around for a while? It's not new, no, it's been around. How about mixtures? Is that 
No, is that something that's new, or is that something that's been around for a while in terms of something being a mixture and you being able to say it's a mixture, but not being able to say anything else beyond that? No, that's that's also been around since DNA began. Ma'am, with regard to this taser that we're talking about, did you also have, uh, and this is the Virgil taser, did you also have occasion to look at <coughs> from the cartridge, which was brief 9546140003.01? Yes, I did. And were you able to develop a profile? Yes, I was. And with regard to that particular profile, were you, what, was, uh, what were your conclusions? That was a partial DNA profile, so I did not get results at all of the locations. It was a possible mixture. There was an indication that there could have been a second source there, but the major component of that DNA profile matched Mr. Rodriguez. Let's take a look at that, what we're talking about. This is going to be 259. Give it 359, take a look at it. You're familiar with it? Yes, I am. And this is the profile we've been talking about? Yes, it is. Look at the initial exhibit 359. I have no objection. The 359 is admitted, may be published. And that's what this one looks like, correct? That's correct, yes. You have something here uh, that says INC 23. What does that mean? INC stands for inconclusive. There was one small uh, DNA type at that location, and it's in brackets. It was a 23. And since I don't know what else could possibly go with that 23, since it is so small, that locus is called inconclusive. And a melogenin, is that the sex marker? Yes, it is. And that's also INC and then in parentheses Y. That's correct. What, what does that tell us? That tells us that the X did not show up. Um, with regard to this particular profile, I think you said that your conclusion was a little bit different than the previous one. What was your conclusion on 359? That it was partial. You see the locations where it says NR? That means at that location there were no results. So I did not get results at all locations, therefore I call it a partial. There was indications of a mixture. But the major component there matched Mr. Rodriguez at all of the locations that I could interpret. And you also had a um, swab from the slide in the frame of a handgun, correct? Yes, I did. And uh, you were able to develop or get some results with regard to that, right? Yes, I was. So what is it that uh, you were able to determine with regard to that? The swab from the slide and the frame of the handgun was a mixed DNA profile. At least two people were present. I could not exclude Mr. Chrisman as the major component, and I could not draw any conclusions on the minor. Let me 
show you that profile. Yes, I do. And that one slide in the frame. Objection as to the part of it that refers to the major contributor, but the inconclusive, I say it has no probative value and is not relevant. Objection to 360. The partial objection to 360 is overruled. The entirety of 360 is admitted and may be published. Take a look at uh, 360 and uh, uh, Location, we have two numbers, right? What are they? A 10 and a 12. How come it is that on number 360, there's a, a star? That means that there are possible other alleolic activity there. There may be some other allele. Um, I know it's a mixture. So that small peak, the software did not even label it with a number. But it is possible that it is an allele. When you start talking about and will, what, what are you saying? Um, I, let, let's step back and, and when you're talking about this process in terms of uh, DNA, what is it the first step that you take with regard to uh, getting these profiles? The DNA analysis itself is basically a four-step process. The first step is called extraction. And during that step, I'm washing the DNA off of the swab or whatever material it's on and getting it into solution. The second step is called quantitation. And during that step, I'm determining how much DNA, if any, I was able to obtain in the first step. Let me ask you about that with regard to exhibit number 360. Do you have a quantitative result? Yes, I do. And a lot of DNA, a little bit of DNA, or I know that those terms probably are not scientific, but if you could tell me the amount and then and put it in layman's terms. To do that, I'm going to have to look into my notes. nanograms of DNA per microliter. A nanogram is a billionth of a gram. And I had 50 microliters. So if we take 0.118 and multiply it by 50, that's how much DNA I was able to obtain. And is that a substantial amount or not? It's enough to do the procedure. But then we then have the, the 30 and the 31.2. There's the match there, correct? Correct. And nine and nine, there's that other match there. Right. The next column, there's also a match there. And then if we get to the B3S, you see that? Yes. And that one, there's 15 and 16. And 
there's a 17 there. So what does that mean? That 17 is in brackets, which means it's very small and it is not big enough for me to draw a reliable conclusion on it. I can neither include nor exclude anybody from that 17. PHO1, we have what? The 6 and the 10 are part of the major component. The 7 is in brackets, again, a very small peak with no conclusions. <coughs> Next one is the 16 and the 24. Then you have 12, 14, and then you have a 15 on, on 360. What does that mean? That 15, again, is, is a very small peak with no conclusions. And BWA. 18 and 19, and then you also have a 17. What does that mean? The 17, again, is small, and there are no reliable conclusions to be drawn on that. And then there's the 8 here, which talks about what? What is that? The 8 has an asterisk by it, so there are possible other alleles associated with that 8 as part of the minor component, and no conclusions can be drawn. And then we have the, the last. Which is the 19 and the 21, right? The last one, FGA, is 1921, yes. And your conclusion with regard to the swabs from the slide in the frame of the Glock handgun are that it's a mixture, right? Correct. And in terms of this mixture, um, as I understand it, mixture means more than one. Or, or does it mean more than that? There are at least two people present in this mixture. And this is the slide in the frame in the block, correct? Correct. Is there something that, um, are you familiar with heat and whether or not it affects whether or not DNA is going to uh, remain behind? Um, heat is one of the things that can cause the degradation of, of DNA. How about a handgun? Are you familiar with the explosive gases that come out from the end? Um, are you familiar with that? Not necessarily the gases themselves, but it does get hot. And is that something that can degrade the DNA that may be at the end of the muzzle or in that area of a handgun? The heat can degrade DNA, yes. And with regard to this, did you also um, examine or have available to you uh, a squab from the end of the muzzle. Yes, I did. And with regard to the swab at the end of the muzzle, is there any biological material that was present at the end of the muzzle? Yes, there was some DNA present at the end of the muzzle, but I could not draw any conclusions on it. You couldn't draw any conclusions as to whose it could be, right? That's correct. But there was some DNA there, right? And when you say DNA, we're talking about biological substances on the muzzle of the gun. You need a biological substance in order to get DNA, yes. And this sample that you have, it is a sample, right? At the end of the, on the muzzle, right? From the end of the muzzle, yes. And this sample, um, in terms of developing a profile, um, were you able to what, why is it that you were not able to form any conclusions? In other words, was it because the sample was so small? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it was weak. There was not much DNA present. You were saying it was weak, I think you said? Yes. Weak, weak is, um, to me, means um, less than an amount. Are, are we talking about, when you say weak, what do you mean? In this case, there was 0.03 nanograms per microliter of DNA. And what is the threshold of nanograms to, in terms so that you can develop a network profile? Um, like I said earlier, I believe we aimed for one nanogram of DNA to be able to go into the reaction. We can get some results from less than that. Um, it depends on how how good the, the DNA is, whether it's degraded or not, whether we're going to get results from less. And this is, uh, I guess, for the threshold, about 0.007 under that. Is that correct? 0.07, 0.07. Yes. 
is less than that, yes. You were talking about the procedure, we were, and we were talking about the quantitative aspect of DNA. And, um, what is the next step at the moment? The next step after quantitation is called amplification. And during that step, I'm making millions of copies of the specific locations on the DNA that I'm interested in. And during the copying process, the copies are tagged with a fluorescent dye. The last step then involves an instrument. Before, before we go there, why are you making copies if you already have the DNA? What's, this, what's up with making copies? There's not enough DNA there to be able to get a result at each of those locations. So part of the process in this type of DNA testing makes copies of the locations that we're looking at and tags them with the fluorescent dye so that we can detect them. And What's the safeguard, I guess, in this amplification process? And what I'm saying is, are you, you're familiar with copies, obviously. Yes. And if you get second and third generation copies, they're not as good as the, let's say, the first generation copy. Is that something that's inherent in this duplication process or not? No, it's not. So what's the last aspect of this process? The last aspect involves an instrument called a genetic analyzer and we put the copied DNA into the instrument. The DNA is separated based on its size and it's detected based on its fluorescent tag. The instrument will give us a printout. It's called an electropherogram, but it's basically a chart that has peaks on it and the peaks are numbered. If we had one of the um, charts that you put up. Okay. Let's go with, uh 360? The numbers there are the numbers that are on the peaks in the, the final printout that I get. So that's what I will be looking at for comparisons. In this case, did you also receive the uh, scrapings from the right fingernails of Daniel Rodriguez? Yes, I did. And did you, were you able to develop a profile from this? Yes, I was. Let me show you uh, another exhibit. Yes, I do. And is that the uh, profile that you developed? Yes, it is. Okay. One is admitted, maybe published. Look at uh, 361. And what were you able to determine if you go to this? The possible mixed DNA profile. There is one location, the second line down with the 31.2 in brackets, that indicates that there's a possible mixture there. The rest of the profile, the major part there, matched Mr. Rodriguez. How about the uh, lip fingernail scrapings? Did you also have occasion to look at those? Yes, I did. And yeah, let me show you that profile. So the 362, 
That's for five. <coughs> Yes, it is. No objection. Submitted, may be published. And the conclusion with regard to 362 is what? So does that DNA profile match Mr. Rodriguez? I don't have any other questions. Ms. Stiller, I just want to ask you about the one taser. Um, you were talking to us early on about the taser. Yes. Uh, um, if, if I was the owner of the taser and I went into the trailer and put my hand on this person, grabbed him, went hands on with him, with one or both of my hands, and then he pulled out, and then a few seconds or minutes later, I then pulled out my taser with the hand that I touched that other person with, would that likely put that other person's DNA on my taser? It would depend on how much DNA you were able to get from the person that you were holding. Right. Is that a very, but is it a good possibility? That, that's a way it could be transferred around this corner Mr. Martinez was talking about. It is a possibility, yes. It depends on how much DNA was transferred in the first place. And, and, and the, the wetter the person, I mean, obviously, if you touch them on the coat like this, it would be zero, right? It would be a lot less, yes. But if the person was like a little wet, slippery or whatever, might be a chance it'd be a lot more DNA that would get on my hands from that other person. If the person was sweating, for instance, then it's it's more likely to get DNA on your hand. And if I went outside and, and then pulled my taser uh, with that same hand that I touched that person with, that would be a way that it'd be very possible to get that person's DNA around that corner? It is possible for it to happen that way, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Martinez? With regard to the hypothetical that you were given, if the DNA that we're talking about is on the handle, is it something, again, like this sort of creepy, crawly kind of um, glob that sort of generates itself and goes to, for example, the front end of the taser, or is it something that stays there? Is it something that crawls all over the place? It's not going to be crawling as far as which part of a taser. I've never seen a taser, so I don't know the proximity of these things. Well, let's take a look at um, exhibit number 222. If the person is grabbing it like this, would it be then that, assuming that he has some DNA here, would the DNA then somehow crawl to the front of the taser? Is that how that, that works? No, that's not how that works. I would expect if he, if a person got DNA from another person on their hands and picked up the handle of the taser, that's where I would expect the DNA to be from the other person if there was a transfer. So, Jim, I'm going to reopen and ask about Exhibit 218. Okay. With regard to Exhibit 218, which is a bullet. And it's our item number 21. Did you develop a profile with regard to that? And let me give you the item number. Or if you can find it. It's 9955594-0021.01. Let me have that marked as an exhibit. to this particular uh, pro 
profile. Is it a mixture? Is it one person or one person? It's a single source profile, one person. And that's contained there in tip 363? Yes. Look at the admission of exhibit 363. No objection. 63 is admitted, may be published. And 363, if we compare that to 356, <coughs> do they match? Yes, they do. Okay, so who is the contributor of that biological material? The DNA profile from the bullet matches Mr. Rodriguez. I don't have any questions. He reopened any we cross. No, Your Honor. No we cross. Ms. Stone would be excused. Mr. Martinez. Yes. Any objection, Mr. Merritt? Um, I would just ask to be subject to. Okay. Uh, Ms. Stone, because you may be recalling the witness, I ask that you not talk about your testimony with anybody but the words. You're free to go about your business in the meantime. So you're free to go for now. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Martinez. The next week witness is Lucian Haig, and he is time specific for Wednesday at 10:30. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on the schedule that the lawyers and, uh, had predicted, so we just ended a little bit early today. Uh, but we are on the timetable we had promised you, so we'll end a little early today. Please remember the admonition: keep an open mind, don't do any homework about the case, avoid any exposure about the case, stay healthy. We'll see you Wednesday at 10:30. Jurors are excused. All rise for jury. Anything for the record for now, Mr. Martinez? Yes, I have a, uh, some time specific witnesses for Wednesday. Lucian Hayes is at 10.30. If he's not finished, he can return Thursday at 1.30. Uh, uh, then at 1.30, I have uh, Susan Johnson. She's with T-Mobile, and she's flying in. And then at 2.30, I have Dr. Johnson. So, uh, Mr. I guess the question is, Mr. Murray's if, if we have to interrupt testimony to accommodate schedules, do you have any objection to that? Oh, no, not, not at all. All right. Sure. We'll work around their schedules. Anything else for now, Mr. Merrins? There you are. I will see everybody Wednesday at 1025.